And if you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to Zechariah chapter 1. We'll be continuing uh, working our way through, uh, through that book. And today we come to uh, verse 7. So to our, our passage for today will be Zechariah 1, verses 7 through 17. Zechariah 1, verses 7 through 17. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Edo, saying, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. Then I said, What are these, my Lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, These are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth remains at rest. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, How long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, against which you have been angry these seventy years? And the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So the angel who talked with me said to me, Cry out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, and I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. Thus far, the reading of God's word. And as we prepare to uh, exposit that word, let's pray and ask that the Lord would be with us during this time. Let's pray. Eternal Father, who has spoken in various times and in various ways to your people in the past, but in these last days in your Son, the incarnate word, we pray that you will open the mouth of your servant to proclaim that word in the power of the Spirit. And we pray that this same Spirit will open the heart, uh, hearts of its hearers here assembled to receive your holy gospel and write on their hearts your holy law, even as you have promised. All of this, gracious Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, probably many of you have heard the expression, probably almost all of you have heard the expression, a picture's worth a thousand words. It's a very well-known expression, right? And what it simply means is that oftentimes a picture can be more effective in communicating something than can simply telling someone about it, right? For example, I could describe to you in, uh, in uh, detail, uh, the, uh, in probably painful detail, the Milky Way galaxy. I could try to tell you what stars are there, um, and I could try to describe what it looks like, or I could just show you a picture or have you look up into the night sky And that would be worth so much more, wouldn't it? Because you see the beauty of the Milky Way galaxy. You don't need to know all the names of each star and uh, and their orientation exactly, unless uh, unless that's part of your work maybe. But, But in order to really appreciate it, in order to really appreciate the beauty of that, you just look at it and you see how beautiful it is. In that case, a picture is really worth a thousand words and is more effective than words. And this is often the case in scripture, sometimes the case in scripture as well, that a picture is worth a thousand words. This is often the way that God reveals himself to his people is through pictures, through vivid representations of his salvation in order to encourage his people, right? When Jacob was at Bethel, the Lord simply could have said to him, 
this is the house of God, this is the gate of heaven, but instead he showed him that vision of angels ascending and descending on, uh, on the ladder. And that was far more effective for Jacob in that instance to see that. And this is often the way that God reveals himself, is through visions, through vivid depictions of his kingdom and of his salvation. And as we come now to uh, Zechariah, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, we enter a new section of the book of Zechariah, a new section which is largely taken up with detailing uh, the visions, that the series of visions that uh, the Lord gave to Zechariah, visions about his kingdom, visions about the Lord's salvation, visions intended to encourage those uh, returned exiles. This uh, this set of um, these set of visions, the set of chapters in the book is dated to uh, February 15 of 519. So you may remember that the first uh, sermon that Zechariah preached um, that we considered last week in the opening six verses of the book was dated to October or November of 520. So this is a few months later. It's the beginning of the following year. And, uh, and the Lord gives Zechariah these series of encouraging visions about his kingdom, encouraging uh, those exiles who had returned, right, uh, about almost, almost now 20 years ago, who had uh, begun to rebuild the temple, who had been so initially excited but had quickly, uh, had quickly stopped rebuilding the temple because of a series of uh, financial difficulties, laziness, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and opposition that was uh, people that were opposing them. And so this is now how the Lord is going to encourage them to continue in the work of rebuilding the temple, which now almost 20 years later they've taken up again. They've said, okay, we, the Lord was right. The Lord was right to deal with us in this way. He was right to punish our fathers. He was right to uh, punish us even now with uh, giving us poor uh, returns on our crops, with making us uh, a poorer people as, as a punishment for, uh, for failing to be faithful to the Lord and continue to rebuild the temple as we've been commanded. And so as they've uh, now begun that work, Zechariah's job, what the Lord tasks Zechariah with, uh, is really now encouraging the people to continue in that work of building the temple by, uh, by giving them encouragement about the Lord's salvation and also by giving them explanation about what it means uh, that the Lord is once again going to be dwelling in their midst, once again uh, that his house is going to be rebuilt among them um, and giving them explanation of what that means and, uh, and exhorting them as well to be the holy people of God uh, that they are as, as their holy God dwells in their midst. So this first vision, which we, uh, which we read in verses 7 through 17 today, really brings this needed encouragement by simply reminding the people of Judea, the returned exiles, that the Lord rules all things on behalf of his people. That's really what this vision is about. It's communicating to them that the Lord rules all things on behalf of his chosen people. And we see three things in particular about God's rule in this passage. We see first the all-encompassing scope of God's rule, that God's rule is all-encompassing in its scope. We see second, the avenging jealousy of God's rule. And finally, we see the abundant mercy of God's rule. So those will be our three points for this morning, the all-encompassing scope of God's rule, the avenging jealousy of God's rule, and the abundant mercy of God's rule. And really, we see the all-encompassing scope of God's rule in the vision itself. There's the vision in verses 8 through 11, and then there are those gracious and comforting words which are given in the remainder of our passage. And the vision in verses 8 through 11 of the uh, horse rider and the horses behind him is what really brings out the all-encompassing scope of God's rule. We see basically three components of this vision that are given to us in verse 8. Zechariah says, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. So the three components that we see of this vision are first the man uh, riding on a red horse, and probably he's Uh, He's the commander of these teams of horses. The other horses are stationed behind him, and he's in front of them. So probably we're to see him as the commander of uh, of these other teams of horses that are behind him. So we have this commander 
Uh, we also have the location given to us, that he's among the myrtle trees in the glen. And then finally, we have these three groups of horses who are behind the commander, these three teams of horses, we might say. And then we get in verses 9 through 11, really the explanation of this vision. And Zechariah uh, asked the question that probably many of us are asking ourselves right now. And he's not, uh, he's not pretending that he understands what's going on here. And uh, so he says, what is this? What are these? What, what does this vision mean, he says? And he does indeed get an explanation of the vision. By, uh, from the angel who talked with me, which is a character in uh, many of these visions of Zechariah who will reappear, and oftentimes commentators will call this angel the interpreting angel because his job in the visions is usually to interpret the visions for Zechariah and to explain what's going on, and that's indeed what he does here. He says, I will show you what these are. And the man on the red horse then gives the explanation in verse 10. He says, these are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. In other words, these teams of horses are the Lord's patrollers. They're his surveillance teams, we might say, who've been sent out to surveil, to patrol the earth, and to see what's going on all over the earth, and then to report back. They're returning now to give their report. That's where we are in this vision, is they've gone out, they've seen what's going on on the earth, and now they're returning back to give their report. And in verse 11, they do give the report. They say, we have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth remains at rest. So they went out, they saw what's going on all over the earth, these, uh, the Lord's surveillance teams, and now their report back is, all the earth remains at rest. This is their report that they're bringing back to the Lord. So how are we to understand what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is actually kind of like the Pony Express. Probably many of you learned about that in school. Many of you, uh, probably some of you maybe are learning about it currently in school if you are taking American history. And the Pony Express, of course, is, uh, was used um, in the history of our nation as a way to move mail from one side of the country to the other very quickly. It was the fastest way for a period of time to get mail across the country. And uh, one rider would, uh, would take the piece of mail, he would ride for a period of time really fast and then hand it off to another rider. And that's kind of like what we're seeing here. The Persians had actually a very similar system to this in Zechariah's day. Their empire was massive. And so they needed a way to get information and reports and mail across the empire really quickly and really efficiently. And so they had a system very much like the Pony Express that we have or that we had in our country at one point. Um, this is, it's important for a king especially, right, to get these reports about battles. Have I won or lost this battle? To get reports about uh, uprisings uh, on the other end of his empire. To get reports from his governors about taxes and, and so on and so forth. Um, so this system is especially important for a king, right, to be apprised at all times of what's going on in his country. And this is really the picture that Zechariah is seeing is that just as the Persians in, uh, in Zechariah's day had the best and the fastest communication system in the world, so the Lord has the best and the fastest communication system in the world. He knows everything that's going on at all times. He knows what's going on everywhere. Nothing is hidden from him. He knows about uprisings, we might say. He knows about revolts against him and his kingdom. He knows everything that's happening everywhere. And isn't this a comforting truth? That our God, the God of Zechariah, who is our God still today, the God of, of, uh, of, of uh, our God still today, sees everything. He knows everything, that nothing is hidden from him. Your deepest thoughts, your plans, your hopes, your dreams, your sorrows, God knows them all. He hears your prayers. He knows your needs. Nothing is hidden from him. But sometimes we doubt this, don't we? This doesn't always feel true. We may know intellectually that this is true, but sometimes we doubt this truth, don't we? We feel like this isn't true. We feel like God doesn't see, like he doesn't know. You might pray for something for so long and God doesn't grant your prayer. 
You say, deliver me, Lord, from this trial. Spare my friend from this pain. Please let me get into this school. Please let me get this job that I really want. Whatever it might be, whatever you might be praying for. And the Lord doesn't answer. He doesn't seem to know what's going on. And we ask ourselves, does he see? Does he know? Does he really care? And maybe you don't doubt that the Lord sees and knows, but that is your question is, does he care? I know he sees and knows, but does he care about me? Does he care about, uh, about delivering me from this trial? You see no change in your situation, and you ask yourself, is he really for me? Does he care? And this is exactly how many in Zechariah's day were feeling, asking themselves, does the Lord care? Does the Lord know? Does he see us? Will we always be this weak? Will we always be under foreign oppression? Will we ever have our own freedom back? Will we ever have a king back? Will we ever have an army back? And this is why the angel of the Lord intercedes for his people in verse 12. This people that are wondering if God is still for them, wondering if God's anger will be against them forever. Their fathers, remember, broke the covenant. And so now they're wondering, is the Lord really for us? Does he care about us? Will he be against us forever? The report of the Lord's patrollers was that all the earth was at peace, all the earth was at rest, but not Judah, right? That's the subtext here. The Judeans, the returned exiles aren't at peace, they aren't at rest. They're under foreign oppression, they have no king, they have no army, they have no temple or palace or walls. All the earth is at rest, at peace. They're happy. They have no problems, in other words. But Judah is suffering. They're not at peace. They're not at rest. And this is exactly how we can feel too, isn't it? That we're not at peace and not at rest, that everyone around us seems so happy. Why be a Christian at all, right? It's so hard. It just seems to make life harder in this world. It leads so often to mocking, to being belittled, to being taunted, to being hated, or just to being considered weird, right? We think to ourselves, everyone else is at peace, but not me, not us, not Christ's church. And what's your comfort in these times when you feel like everyone else is at peace and you're not? When you wonder if the Lord is still for you, if he still hears, if he still cares, when you're in the midst of a trial that feels like it will never end, when it feels like it might be easier to just go the way of the world, what's your comfort in these times? Well, it's the same comfort that the people of Judea here have in Zechariah's vision. It's an intercessor, that they have an intercessor that we have an intercessor. And here the angel of the Lord intercedes for them. He says, O Lord of hosts, How long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these 70 years? And it's because of the angel of the Lord's intercession that then the Lord goes on to answer gracious and comforting words to the people in the remainder of the passage. And this is our comfort as well in times when it feels like the Lord is not for us. When it feels like he doesn't see, that he doesn't know, that he doesn't care, that he doesn't hear that we have an intercessor. The Lord knows all. He knows the plight of his people. He knows your plight, each and every one of you. He's got the fastest communication system in the world. And when we call out to him, even though we don't deserve it, we can be sure that he will hear us for the sake of his son, who is always living to make intercession for us in the presence of his father. Because of Christ, God's rule over all things is for you is for us, his church, is for all of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ. And as with Zechariah and the people of his day, as with the returned exiles, he answers us gracious and comforting words because of our great intercessor in heaven before his throne. So call out to him with confidence, knowing that he sees you, knowing that he hears you, knowing that he cares about you and loves you for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ. That brings us then to the gracious and comforting words in the first part of those gracious and comforting words which the Lord answers the people uh, brings out the avenging jealousy of God's rule. We see that in verses 14 and 15. That the Lord is the jealous avenger 
of his people. Uh, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, and I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. The Lord is extremely jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, he says. We see God's jealousy, for example, in the second commandment, where he says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Why are we not to worship other gods? Why are we not to make carved images? Because the Lord is a jealous God. <coughs> He's zealous. He has a passion for his own glory, his own honor, his own name. And that alone, he takes this very seriously. If we continue to read the second commandment, he goes on to say, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. You don't want to be on the wrong side of God's jealousy, in other words. He takes this very seriously. He's jealous for his name and for his worship, but he's also jealous for his people. He's exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, we see here. He's exceedingly jealous for those who dwell in Jerusalem, for those who worship on Mount Zion. He desires them for his own possession, not to be a possession of the nations, not to be under their oppression, to be his own. The nations are on the wrong side of this jealousy of God. They're oppressing God's chosen people, and God will avenge this. He will avenge these nations on behalf of his people. And this is why in verse 15 he says, I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease, for while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. This is the same language as we saw if you look back to Zechariah's sermon in, uh, in verse 2, where he said, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Now we read he's exceedingly angry with the nations. The Lord used Babylon as an instrument to punish his people. He used them for a time, but his wrath has been poured out on his people in the 70 years of their exile. His judgment has been filled up against them, in other words, and now the nations are continuing to oppress his people. They're overstepping their bounds, in other words. His wrath is spent, but the nations are continuing to oppress. They're opposing, as we read in Ezra and Nehemiah, they're opposing the rebuilding of the temple of the walls. They're opposing the uh, people of Judah having their own king again, reinstituting the proper worship of God. In other words, they're furthering the disaster against God's people. His wrath is spent, but the nations are continuing along this path. These nations are the ones at ease, the world that's at peace, as the patrollers reported, who are continuing to oppress God's people. And we should remember at this point, again, that the Lord is not just jealous for the people in Zechariah's day, 2,500 years ago. He's jealous for you too today, 2,500 years later. He remains jealous for you. He wants you. He wants us for his own possession. And we're constantly attacked by our greatest enemies, the world, our own flesh, our own sinful nature that continues to war against us and the devil. This can so often feel like a losing battle, can't it? Like we can never overcome these enemies. But take heart. Take heart, brothers and sisters. Your God is jealous for you. He wants you for his own. And for all of you who trust in Christ, he will keep you against these enemies until the end. And as with Zechariah's audience, he won't only show his avenging jealousy toward you, but also his abundant mercy. So this brings us to our final point for today, the abundant mercy of God's rule. And we see that really in verses 16 to 17 of our passage. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts, my city shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. I have returned, the Lord says. He's fulfilling the promise he made to the people in that opening sermon of Zechariah's in verses 1 through 6, right? He said, if you return to me, if you repent, that I will return to you. And that's indeed what the Lord does here. He says, I have returned. I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. They accepted this free offer of God that he held out to them, and he returned. 
He says, my house will be rebuilt. In other words, his presence will once again dwell in the midst of them. The temple will once again be in their midst. And this is not only true of the temple and of Jerusalem, or this is true rather of all of Jerusalem, not just the temple in the middle of the city. He says the measuring line will be stretched out. This is one of the first steps of rebuilding a city, is to, is, or the, the walls of the city, I should say, is to stretch out the measuring line. In other words, the whole city of Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. And as a result of this return and the rebuilding, he says, my city shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. Why does he say again here? He says again twice here. What are they looking back to? Well, I think they're looking back to the days of David and the days of Solomon, the, the height of prosperity that, uh, that Israel ever saw back in the days when there was a united nation still, when the two kingdoms hadn't been split apart, when the northern kingdom hadn't been sent into exile, before, long before the southern kingdom was sent into exile. And he's promising these days of prosperity once again, days when once again the people will, uh, will have a holy God dwelling in their midst, when once again they will be his holy people. And this is great encouragement to keep rebuilding, to be faithful with what they've been given, to not stop the rebuilding project, even though so often it might seem fr uh, pointless or fruitless to keep doing that. This is a promise that greater days are coming. And brothers and sisters, as we come to a close today, we so often feel like these returned exiles in Zechariah's day, don't we? Like we're unimportant. Like everyone around us is at ease. Like God is not for us. In many ways, we're in a time like them. We're in a time of less glory, waiting for the great glory which has been promised us to come. They looked back to the days of David and Solomon and the Lord promised to them a glory like that again. And he promises to us a glory which is set before us, the glory ultimately of the new heavens and the new earth. But right now we are in a time like them of less glory, awaiting that greater glory which has been promised to us. They were called in their day to be faithful with what they had been given, that although they were small and weak and poor in the eyes of the world, Although they often felt this way, to continue to rebuild the temple, to continue to be God's holy people, to be faithful, to obey his commandments. And this is what we're called to in our day as well, to be faithful with what we've been given, to be the holy people of God as he dwells in the midst of us through his spirit, to obey God's law gratefully for all that he's done for us, for the great salvation that he's given to us to carry out the daily callings God has given us faithfully and joyfully for his glory. Just as with them, he promises us days of greater glory, days of peace, days when all will be made right, days when our sufferings, days when our trials will be ended, days when we will dwell with the Lord forever in the new heavens and the new earth. Because our Lord Jesus Christ has won for us those days of greater glory. He has won those days for us through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, and he is now, even now, in heaven, interceding for us in the presence of his Father. He's jealous for you. His abundant mercy is for you, and he will return one day to bring you to himself. So I encourage you, put your faith in him today. Put your faith today in his finished work for you in his intercession on your behalf and know that God's rule over all things, his jealousy, his mercy, and these days of greater glory will most certainly be yours. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, thank you that not only do you rule and govern all things, but you rule and govern all things on behalf of your people. Thank you that in these last days, Christ has won prosperity and comfort and mercy for us, that you have given him all authority in heaven and on earth, and that he rules all things on behalf of his church. We are so grateful to be called your people and to have confidence that even though we may feel weak and despairing at times, uh, and we may cry out, how long until our Lord returns in glory, that Christ knows our needs and he hears our cries. May we be faithful with what you have given us. May we strive to be the holy people we are, as you dwell in our midst. And may you receive all glory and honor and praise.
together with our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen.